It's just after lunchtime. This is the third and final hour, or rather, this is all angles here on ENCA. Good afternoon. I'm Masako Rashlaka. Now, it is that time of the day when we give you an update on how far many of the stories we've been following for you throughout the course of the day have advanced. Here's your lunchtime update. All right, we've got our reporters on the ground who have been out and about bringing us the latest on the news of our top stories. I'm joined now uh, by Avu M. Dila uh, in Pretoria and Heidi Jokos is in Johannesburg. All right, let's start with you, Avue. What measures, for instance, we also have Slindelo Masigani in Bloemfontein. Let's start with Avue, though. Avue, a little earlier on, uh, the uh, Water and Sanitation Department actually giving an update on the cholera outbreak, particularly in the city of Tuani. They also had the mayor of the capital with them. What are they saying? they're going to do to address this crisis. Good afternoon, Maseko, and the promise here is that the people of Hamanskwal will have clean drinking water coming out from their taps by March 2024. In fact, remember the reports that we've been having earlier on in the week of the feces that has been seeping through the taps of the residents in Hamanskwal. It's something that's been confirmed here yeah, by the Water and Sanitation Minister, Senzo Mkunu, after receiving some of those reports himself, going to these families and actually checking out the situation and confirming that, yes, indeed, that's what the people of Hamanskwal have been exposed to. So there are a number of measures now uh, that will be taken in the interim, uh, short, medium and long term measures uh, to help and uh, you know alleviate the situation. For one, those tankers will still be crisscrossing Hamanskwal, uh, providing water in the interim. But we've also been promised here that there will be a temporary measure because you understand the issue is the polluting of the Royval water treatment plant. We understand that it's polluted and therefore it's also then uh, polluting the Apis River, which in turn is then polluting the Lyorkans Dam. And therefore the timber treatment works can't um, you know clean the water and provide that clean water into the tap. So the you know, mid-term plan here is that there will be a Mahali's package plant uh, that will be in place that will clean that water uh, for the timber work. Uh, treatment plant and then provide that clean water by March. And then in the long term, of course, is sorting out the issues of the Royval water treatment plant. The promise that that will be done by November 2026. But the bigger issue, Maseko, is that where this money will come from. We do understand that in totality, all of this needs some uh, 4 billion rand. And the money that's been put in the play, you know, in place at the moment, which has been signed off by the city of Tuane, is 450 million rand. And I spoke to the mayor a bit earlier on to suggest that while they've coughed out this 450 million rand, it'll be focusing on the Royval water treatment plant. And the rest of it is to come from the Department of Water and Sanitation. I had also that conversation with the minister a bit earlier on to suggest that this is money that will be sourcing out coming from this particular briefing. And they'll be, you know, knocking at the doors of Treasury, finding other finders and then, uh, you know, funders to try and come to the amount of that four billion rand that's needed mm. uh, in totality. But take a listen to some of the interventions and measures mentioned there by the Minister of Water and Sanitation in terms of what needs to happen now uh, to help the water woes of Hamanskra. We are going to uh, install improved wastewater technology in the Royval wastewater treatment technology in the Royval wastewater treatment works to improve the way in which the works treats the sewage and to increase the quality of the discharged effluent which goes into the Arpis River. This will reduce the levels of E. coli from the treated sewage water from the Royval plant that is released into the Arpis River. That will be done according to our plans between August this year and March 2024. Secondly, in order to improve drinking water provision to the residents of Hamans Kral, Mahali's water, which is a water board under the, under the Department of Water and Sanitation, will install a portable water treatment plant, which is also known as a package plant, at its clip drift water treatment works near Hamans Kral. This will produce 30 to 40 megalitres per day of treated drinking water which will be fed into the Hammonds Kral piped water distribution system. All right, Lee, let's come to you in Bloemfontein. Of course, Nandi Pamakudumana's application uh, to have her arrest in Arusha, Tanzania on the 7th of April deemed unlawful and illegal has uh, begun. What have been her lawyer's reasons for this application and the response from the state? 
Well, quite interesting arguments that we're hearing unfolding here inside the Free State High Court where uh, Dr. Nandipa's legal team has laid the basis in terms of why they've brought this application, uh, saying that the process um, of deportation as alleged by the state just simply uh, was not lawful. In fact, um, Anton Katz, advocate Anton Katz, um, has gone as, as far as to say that this was an extradition that was disguised um, as a deportation, saying that a deportation is a unilateral act uh, by the country that is doing um, that uh, particular process, and that as soon as a delegation was assembled um, to negotiate um, this uh, deportation, then it then became um, a matter of extradition. And so we've also heard now uh, just before lunch, uh, the advocate representing the NPA as well as the police, uh, they insist that, of course, the police did not have any um, anything to do uh, with the deportation process, saying that they were merely observing it, uh, also saying that uh, the prayers that uh, Dr. Nandipa is seeking in terms of setting aside um, her arrest as well as legal proceedings against her in the magistrate's court um, isn't justifiable. Um, and in fact, uh, stating that uh, the NPA, of course, does have the uh, jurisdiction or has um, the responsibility of deciding um, uh, who they're going to uh, prosecute and on what basis. And also going on to say that the issue of the police being involved was the matter that Besta, who is a convicted uh, rapist and murderer, had fled from uh, South Africa and, of course, escaped from prison. So um, the issue there was not uh, for the SAPS to be there uh, uh, for Nandipa in particular, but uh, the fact that the police were involved was because a convicted felon had fled um, the country. Also stating, uh, which was quite interesting, is that uh, the lawyer representing uh, the SAPS as well as the NPA also says that in the founding affidavit uh, for Dr. Nandipa, she doesn't mention how she actually um, had told officials that she wants to go home um, and that she never objected at any point um, on getting onto that chartered plane. In fact, uh, she had told officials that she wanted to go home because she was a mother and she wanted to return to her, uh, to her children. Uh, the lawyer also um, stated that the fact that uh, Nandipa isn't truthful about how she ended up in Tanzania um, uh, and has also told uh, what he describes as um, utter untruths in her founding affidavit uh, shows that she has not taken the court into her confidence. Let's just take a listen to some of those arguments. The first argument is the whole scheme, and I'll come to it when I drill down to the facts, we will show that this deportation from Tanzania was a disguised extradition in the sense that it was collusion between the South African officials and the Tanzanian officials where they tell your lordship it was an agreement to deport, an agreement. And we emphasize this word agreement. The Tanzanian officials, the South African officials agreed to something. That is extradition par excellence. Deportation is a unilateral act. <coughs> so when the South African officials say, huh, we've got nothing to do with this. This was Tanzania exercising its own sovereignty, a unilateral act. Your Lordship will scratch his head and say, well, where was, why was there an agreement between these two countries? All right, now, Heidi, the Eaton family in Johannesburg is considering suing ESCOM for their three-year-old daughter's death. Uh, we know that uh, um, she died after oxygen machines went flat due to extended power cuts. Who have you been able to speak to so far today, uh, Heidi, in terms of uh, getting an update, and what steps can this family take? Yes, so, so I think just for context purposes, we do know that little Nehemiah died last week, Thursday, Masekho, and the reason for this is because uh, she got a viral infection and she needed to be on oxygen. Uh, however, the oxygen uh, machines, um, the battery life uh, ran out, and the reason for this is because they were supposed to get power back, but because of the extended power cuts in the Bromhof-Randberg area, 
they unfortunately had their oxygen tank uh, not refilled because they were expecting the power to come back on time and uh, they then rushed um, Nehemiah to the hospital and sadly she passed on in her mother's arms on her way to the hospital. Her funeral was yes and I think the most tragic part in all of this is that her family who had spoken to us on Sunday was still considering whether or not they are going to be suing ESCOM or the state with regards to little Nehemiah's death um, and they were telling me how difficult it was for them to prepare for their baby girl's uh, funeral because they had not had power since Monday. Um, so it just seems as though the power cuts are relentless in the randburg Bromhof area. And um, the Eton family is saying, you know, they wish that their story and their daughter's story can actually put pressure on government officials to understand that having electricity is a basic right and it's a service that they're paying for mm. and they're not receiving it. Um, and unfortunately, tragically, they lost their daughter because of all of this. Um, we will be speaking to Nehemiah's dad um, a little uh, later on this afternoon, uh, but we did get a chance to speak to the Human Rights Commission, who have also expressed their dissatisfaction and concern around the power, ongoing power cuts and how this is really causing havoc in many people's lives, in all of our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are, of course, looking into the matter as to the kind of impact it's having, uh, particularly in, um, in this family's uh, case. Let's listen to what the Human Rights Commission had to say. As a Human Rights Commission, um, we've noted the impact of load shedding um, on health, health infrastructure and health budgeting. Um, in our last engagement with MEC Health, for instance, we were advised on the, um, the increased budget in some of the bigger hospitals as a result of the money that must be used for the functioning of generators, which um, was not something that was previously um, that had to be budgeted for previously. So there's definitely an impact on load shedding on the provision of health care. We can't necessarily say at this point, um, uh, we haven't received as well that report from the MEC on whether they've tied it to, to load shedding, but one can't really exclude it because we can say, you and I, we, everybody feels the impact of load shedding. And the people who are worst affected by those are those people who even on ordinary um, instances cannot access basic um, health care provisions. Um, even basic things like accessing a hospital, accessing a clinic, accessing an, an ambulance in a Right, that was your ENCA lunchtime update from all angles with reporters Linda Lomasigani, Avi Mdira and Heidi Jokos. Thank you very much, team.